The Gospel according to Luke, chapter 3, verses 23 through 38. Hear now the word of the Lord as he speaks through the evangelist, Luke. Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age, being the son, as was supposed, of Yosef, the son of Eli, the son of Matat, the son of Lewi, the son of Melchi, the son of Iyanai, the son of Yosef, the son of Matathias, the son of Amoz, the son of Nahum, the son of Heshli, the son of Nagai, the son of Maat, the son of Matathias, the son of Semyon, the son of Iosech, the son of Ioda, the son of Ionan, the son of Lesa, the son of Zerubabel, the son of Shealtiel, the son of Neri, the son of Melchi, the son of Adi, the son of Kosam, the son of Almadam, the son of Er, the son of Yeshua, the son of Eliezer, the son of Yorim, the son of Matat, the son of Lewi, the son of Simeon, the son of Yuda, the son of Yosef, the son of Yonam, the son of Eliakim, the son of Malea, the son of Mena, the son of Matatha, the son of Nathan, the son of Dawid, the son of Yeshe, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of Salah, the son of Nachshon, the son of Aminidav, the son of Admin, the son of Arni, the son of Hetzron, the son of Perez, the son of Yuda, the son of Yaakov, the son of Itzak, the son of Avraham, the son of Terach, the son of Nahor, the son of Serug, the son of Reu, the son of Peleg, the son of Ever, the son of Shelach, the son of Kainan, the son of Arphaxad, the son of Shem, the son of Noach, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Yared, the son of Mahal Aliel, the son of Kainan, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. This is God's holy and inspired word. The grass withers, the flower fades. For some of us, any mention of history instantly causes us to fall asleep. For others, listening to someone talk about genealogies or their family tree puts us into a coma. And for others still, a Bible reading that takes more than a minute is enough to put us out. And this morning, you get all three at once. Looks like almost everybody stayed awake, so that's good. And I have good news for those who did. You have a special treat this morning. Because what we are doing today is answering one of the most important questions that anyone can ever ask. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Don't you think that's an important question? Every single Christian and even non-Christians need to grapple with this question. Who is Jesus? In order to answer this question, we are going to consider the genealogy of Jesus with an overview of Luke's list. And then we're going to dig a little bit deeper and consider some of the most important names on that list, which, by the way, was hard to choose. And then we'll conclude by looking at the final name on that list. 
Again, this morning we are answering one of the most important questions that anyone can ever ask. Who is Jesus? Let's begin by looking at his genealogy. Now, I'm sure you had many questions as this was being read. For example, why does Luke's genealogy look different from Matthew's? What's the structure here? It just looks like a long list. What is Luke really trying to tell us? But most importantly, you were probably wondering, why is the pastor reading the names incorrectly? I can see the list. That says Joseph, Joshua, and Jared, not Yosef, Yeshua, and Yarev. I can see what it says. That says Abraham, Noah, and Adam, not Avraham, Noah, and Adam. His name is Jesus, pastor, not Jesus. That's more in the south, though. Jesus. It's all right. Well, it's true the names may look a little bit differently in our English Bible than how they were just read. But I do that for a few reasons. As you know, when we went through the genealogies in Genesis... I want to remind us that the Bible isn't written in English. Sorry to uh, spoil it for those King James only truthers out there. But the Bible, the New Testament was written in Greek and the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and Aramaic. And it's really important for us to remember that by the time these names get to us in English, they've already passed through two or three ancient languages. Helps to remind us that American Christians, English-speaking Christians, are not the center of the world. The English-speaking church is relatively young on the timeline of God's people. Helps us to remember, gives us that flavor of the ancient world, the world that our Lord Jesus came into. It was a Greek-speaking world. Greek was kind of like the English of today where everybody knew it. Everybody in the world knows a little bit of English. Everyone from Rome to North Africa to Jerusalem, even to India, knew Greek. It was a Hellenistic world after Alexander the Great. Even in the Roman Empire, they spoke, in addition to Latin, Greek. And at the time, those living in Judea, in Galilee, Jews, post-Babylonian exile, they all spoke Aramaic. Aramaic was their mother tongue. And they were all familiar with Hebrew, at least liturgically. So by reading the names in something that resembles the original pronunciation, we're reminded of the historicity and antiquity of Christianity. We're reminded that it's not our buddy Joey who lives down the street. It's Yosef. It's not our cousin Jared. It's Yarev. And it's not our coworker Matt. It's Mathat or Matathias. Now, the reason I do it like that is that hopefully it keeps those who fall asleep easily awake during a genealogy. Keeps your mind from wandering onto things that it shouldn't when the word of God is being read. Now, as far as the differences in Luke and Matthew's genealogies, you don't have to worry. It's intentional. They're doing it on purpose. They're going different routes. They're saying different things. Matthew's is highly structured. 14 generations before Babylonian exile, 14 generations after Babylonian exile. And he begins with Abraham and goes to Jesus. Luke begins with Jesus and goes to Adam and God. Luke uses different names than Matthew. They're often spelled differently, and that's because there's more of a Jewish flavor to Matthew's gospel, and there's more of a Greek flavor to Luke's gospel. Luke lists a different father than Matthew does for Joseph, and scholars have come up with a bunch of different reasons for that, but the most likely is what they call leveret marriage. Leveret marriage is when someone's brother dies, and then he marries his wife, and becomes the legal father of his brother's children. Happened often in the Jewish context because it was commanded by God in Deuteronomy 25, 5 and 6. 
Now, as far as why Luke provides different names than Matthew does, we need to remember that genealogies in the Bible intentionally skip some generations. It's not dishonesty. That's just how they did genealogies. They skip generations intentionally. But most importantly, this is what we have to remember. This is what we talked about in Genesis. Genealogies in the Bible have intentional theological purposes to them. Intentional theological purposes. The point that they're making is a theological point. So what is Luke's theological purpose here? Well, as Jesus is about to begin his ministry, Luke wants the audience to know who Jesus is. He wants us to know that he is the Messiah, the Christ. He wants us to know that this is the long-awaited Redeemer, the one who will save his people from their sins. Luke wants us to know that because of his descent, Jesus is the only one who is uniquely qualified to carry out that messianic work of redemption promised long ago from Genesis 3.15 all the way to Malachi. That's what Luke is telling us. He is the Savior. Savior from what? Aren't people generally good, decent, nice Aren't human beings nice? That's what someone told me before. People are generally good, inherently good. What would they need to be saved from? Well, let's find out as we move on to our second consideration this morning, that Jesus is the son of David, Abraham, and Adam. Now, there were many other names that we could have focused on here, and frankly, we could have done an entire sermon series on some of these names, Joseph, Zerubbabel, Jesse, Judah, Jacob, Isaac, Shem, Noah, Enoch, Seth. That's a huge sermon series right there. And again, you know that I'm not joking. We could easily do that. Next three years, just the genealogy. But I chose these three because I think they get to the essence of what Luke is conveying here. In verse 31, we read that Jesus is the son of Dawid, and of course we know him as David. Who was David? David was that young shepherd whom God chose to destroy the Philistines, beginning with his slaying of that great Philistine warrior, the giant Goliath. We know him as King David. He's the author of many of the Psalms the warrior, poet, musician. We know more about David than any other character in the Old Testament. He's the one whom the Lord set on the throne of Israel. He's one of the most popular people in the Old Testament, and there are a lot of different important scriptures with respect to David, as you well know. But there's one in particular that really sticks out in David's life when it comes to genealogy. Really important. What do we call it? It's called the Davidic Covenant. The Davidic Covenant. If you have a Bible, turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7. going to be reading from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. Verse 12. When your days are fulfilled, the Lord says to David. In other words, he's saying, when you're dead. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers... I will raise up your offspring. That's a really important word when we're talking about genealogies. It means son, essentially. I will raise up your son. I will raise up an offspring who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He, that is the offspring, shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom, Ha'olam. 
forever. Not for a few weeks, not for a few years, not for a few centuries, not for a few millennia, forever. And I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. This is the Davidic covenant. Why is this important? Why are we bothering talking about it this morning? Because Luke is telling us that Jesus is that offspring. The offspring that will sit on the throne forever. Where's Jesus right now? On the throne. The offspring that will build a house for the Lord. Christians, Peter tells us, are living stones of the temple of God. He says that about us. And he says, this is the offspring that will be my son. Gee, I wonder who that could be about. Luke is telling us that this messianic prophecy, the Davidic covenant and the promise therein, is a promise of Jesus. The one who's about to begin his ministry. Who is Jesus? He is the son of David, the messianic offspring promised in the Davidic covenant. That's who Jesus is. Next, we have a name that some of you may be familiar with. Abraham. Abraham. Why is Abraham important? Well, I hope you like covenants. Because Abraham's important because of another covenant, another promise of God. The covenant here is called the Abrahamic covenant. We're really clever with the names we come up, aren't we? By the way, all these covenants, the Davidic, the Abrahamic, these are administrations of the covenant of grace. What, there's another covenant? Yes, it's true. Covenant of grace is God saying how he's going to save his people. And over time, as he reveals himself by way of covenant, he adds to the promises. In other words, with the Davidic, he's saying, it's going to be a son of David, and he's going to sit on the throne forever, and I'm going to be his father, and he's going to be my son. In the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis 17, if you want to turn there with me, you remember when we went through Genesis 17? Remember how many sermons we did on Genesis 17? I had to go look it up because I forgot to. Eight Eight. Eight sermons on Genesis 17. Why would we spend so much time in Genesis 17? Because there are at least eight different ways that Genesis 17 points us to Jesus. For example, one of them is here in Genesis 17, verse 7. The Lord says to Abraham, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you. There's that word again, offspring. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your offspring after you. That's the covenant formula. I will be your God and you will be my people. I will be God to you and your offspring after you. Covenant formula. That's the great promise that goes all throughout the Holy Scriptures. I will be your God and you will be my people. You see it in Genesis and you see it as you close the Bible at the very end of the book of Revelation. How will God make it happen? How will we, Gentiles, become God's people? Through Christ. Christ is the offspring promised through Abraham. And it's not only through Christ We belong to Abraham, but it's through Christ that we now belong to God. You believe that? Or did I make it up? God said it, and I just repeated it. Galatians 3.16 and 29. Now, the promise was made to Abraham and to his offspring, who is Christ. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs, according to the promise. Indeed, Abraham is the father of all believers, Romans 4.16. And Christ is the offspring who was promised, who made that possible. Who is Jesus? He is the son of David. He is the son of Abraham. The third name that we're looking at appears in verse 38 of this morning's text. 
And this is vital. If you weren't paying attention to the first couple, really pay attention now. It's time to, to listen. Verse 38, Jesus is the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam. This is crucial. Jesus is the son of Adam. It's important for two reasons. First, let's go back to the Garden of Eden. Genesis again? I thought we were done with Genesis. Nope, this is why we spent 14 years in Genesis, so that you would already know this stuff, right? Genesis 2, verse 15. Genesis 2, verse 15. Here's another covenant. What's this one called? Extra credit if you get it right. Someone say what it's called. Covenant of? Extra credit right over there. Covenant of works. If you said Adam, that's okay. You were kind of set up for that one, weren't you? It's all right. That's all right. See, covenant of works is different from the covenant of grace because the covenant of grace is God saying, I will do this, and you will be the beneficiaries. The covenant of works is saying, do this and live. Genesis 2, verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And when we hear this, we think, oh, cool, he was the first gardener. He was a horticulturalist. He had a green thumb. Well, you have to remember, these verbs that are used here, work and keep, can just as easily be translated as serve and guard. These are priestly duties. Adam's duties in the garden were not just that of a gardener. He was a temple, or he was a priest in the Edenic temple of God who was charged with serving in the temple and guarding the temple. Just like the old covenant priests had a sword on their hip to keep anything that could possibly defile God's holy presence out. That's what Adam was enlisted to do. He was enlisted in order to keep things that could possibly defile God's Edenic garden temple. Something like, I don't know, Satan... What should Adam have done when the, uh, the serpent slithered in? Cut his head off. He should have crushed the head of the serpent right then and there, shouldn't he have? Should have he not have? Should not he have? I don't know. Or not easy. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So this is the third covenant that we, we have heard this morning, but this one's not about grace. This one's about works. Why is it called the covenant of works? Because by Adam's obedience, that is by doing the works of the law, by doing the works of this covenant, Adam would receive life. Life was offered to Adam. And not just to Adam, but he was our representative. Thus, to all his posterity, to all his offspring, life was being offered based on the work of Adam, the covenant of works. Now, I am aware that it doesn't say the word covenant in this text, but guess what? God somewhere else calls it a covenant. Hosea chapter 6, verse 7, it's called a covenant. So Adam has two options here in this covenant. Obey and live. You need to understand this. Adam is your representative. In the Garden of Eden, in the covenant of works, Adam can obey and live and give life to all of us or disobey and die. That's what the covenant of works is about. Do this and live. Do this and die. What did Adam do? Well, I don't want to play spoiler here for those of you who haven't read it yet. Spoiler alert. He failed. Adam failed. He chose death. In the day that you eat of this tree, you shall surely die. Was God joking? Was he just making a threat and not going to follow through? No, because through Adam, not only did he not receive life, but neither have we. Because through Adam, sin and death have entered into the world and spread to just the worst people. No, everyone, that's right. Romans chapter 5, verse 12, sin came into the world through one man. 
and death through sin. And so death spread to all men, because in Adam all have sinned. Sin and death. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, in Adam, all die, including all of us. That's not nice. No, but it's true. This is why the human race needs a Savior. This is why humanity needs a Redeemer, because we have a sin and death problem, because we need to be purchased out of our sin and misery and death. Look around at your country. Look around at the world. Do I really need to argue that we have a sin and death and misery problem? Or is it not apparent with the use of our senses, with common sense? If you can see and hear and have reason, you can tell that this world is full of sin and misery and death. Right? Humanity is in desperate need of another Adam to come and fulfill the works of that covenant wherein Adam failed. Humanity is in need of a second Adam. Wouldn't you agree? Humanity needs another Adam to come and fulfill the works of the law on our behalf. That's what Luke is telling us. He's saying Jesus is the last Adam. He's the second Adam. He's the Adam who's going to come and fulfill the works of the law. To be the second Adam, the final Adam, the Adam who gives life. That's exactly what the Apostle Paul calls our Lord Jesus. Have you heard that before? He's the last Adam? Good. 1 Corinthians 15, 45. The first man, Adam, became a living person, but the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Because of the first Adam, death. Because of the second Adam, life. Jesus is the last Adam. Jesus is the final Adam, the Adam who has come to give us life. And as Luke prepares us for the ministry of Jesus, he's telling us that's what Jesus is going to do. He's the son of Adam who's going to do that. And we'll see this so clearly next week. In the wilderness, when Jesus is being tempted by the devil. We're going to see a recapitulation of what happened in the garden. We'll see a recapitulation of what happened in Israel's wilderness wanderings. Luke is telling us now that Jesus is the one who is uniquely qualified to set us free from the bonds of sin and death. How? By doing what Adam should have done, by crushing the head Of the serpent. Genesis 3.15. Flip over a page. This is the second part of Jesus' relation to Adam that we have to get. After Adam and Eve are expulsed from the garden, God cursed the serpent and said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between her and Offspring. There's that word again. Offspring. I will put enmity between you and the woman. He's talking to Satan. I will put war. I will put strife between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Or as the NIV puts it, the offspring of the woman will crush the head of the serpent and the serpent will strike the heel of her offspring. The offspring of Adam and Eve will do battle against the serpent. The serpent will strike. The offspring of Adam and Eve will crush the skull of the serpent. When and where would this be accomplished? In the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Repent and believe. When it appeared that the serpent had dealt a fatal blow in his strike on the offspring of Adam and Eve, where on the cross... And in the tomb, when it appeared that Satan's strike was victorious, Christ came out of the grave. He raised from the dead and ascended into heaven so that he would sit on the throne of David. I will give your offspring 
the throne forever. Christ came out of the grave and slayed the serpent by defeating death and ascending into heaven. Who is Jesus? He is the son of David. He is the son of Abraham. He is the son of Adam. And finally, he is the son of God. According to the flesh, he is the son of David, Abraham, Adam, and Eve, according to the flesh. But because he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, because the eternally and only begotten one came in the flesh, he is also the son of God. Why did Jesus have to be not only human, but also divine? Because human nature was so corrupted by the fall that none of us can redeem ourselves. Did you know that? You couldn't redeem yourself. You couldn't offer yourself on the cross as an atonement for anyone, much less yourself. Even the most righteous human would fall short. And so God came in the flesh to do it for us. To offer his perfect obedience from conception to cross. And on the cross, he made full satisfaction for sin. The wages of sin being death. In order to merit our salvation, in order to pull us out of that sin and misery, God's justice required full satisfaction for sin because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Repent and believe in Jesus. Keep repenting. Keep believing. That is the Christian life. Not only did the righteous Son of God offer himself on the cross, but he demonstrated with power that he wasn't just another guy who died on the cross. For his divine nature is demonstrated where? In the resurrection. As Paul writes in Romans chapter 1, verse 4, he was descended from David according to the flesh, but he was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Who is Jesus? He's the long-awaited Messiah, the Christ. Who is Jesus? He is the one who has come to redeem his people, and he did it. In his life, death, and resurrection, he is our Savior. He is the son of David. He is the son of Abraham. He is the son of Adam. He is the son of God. This is what Luke wants us to know going forward. As Jesus' ministry is about to commence, he wants us to know this. But here's another question. Who are you? We've seen who Jesus is. Who are you? Have you turned from your sin and turned to God? Have you repented and believed in Christ and his perfect life and death and resurrection? If you have, then you are a Christian. You are a follower of Christ, and you have been redeemed by his blood. You've been saved from your sin. You've been united to Christ. And thus, when I ask you the question, who are you? The proper response as one whose identity is wrapped up in Jesus is, I am a Christian. That's the proper response. And so, as we consider these things as Christians, far from causing us to yawn because we have another genealogy or perhaps roll our eyes, right? Start thinking about that yard work that we've got going on or the shopping that we have to do or the sporting event we're going to go watch. There's no sports on right now, is there? Basketball, you said? That's not a sport. (laughs) Far from being boring because it's about history, this ought to bring us... You're just throwing the ball in a basket. Come on. This ought to bring us to our knees in awe at the beauty of the Holy Scriptures and how everything fits together perfectly. This ought to bring about in us, because we are Christians, obedience unto God, knowing what he has done for us, the great lengths that he has gone in order to save us from our sins. This ought to cause us to offer ourselves to God. And to offer up praise and honor and glory. And as we prepare our hearts and our minds to now receive that Savior. And even participate in his death here at the table. Let us do that. Let us do it with hearts full of gratitude. 
with mouths that declare His praise, with minds that want to know Him more and more, with bodies that seek to serve Him, and with souls that are united to Him. Who is Jesus? He is the Messiah, the Christ. He is our Redeemer. He is our Savior, and we belong to Him.